guys, welcome to the Found Records podcast. I'm your host, Jessica Ville. Oh my gosh, that's so fancy. Um, and I'm going to be talking about um, history. So, so this, is the, this is a history podcast, but it's not just a history podcast. This is a history podcast that talks about and highlights history that we keep getting wrong. It's one of my biggest pet peeves. Why do we do it? Um, a lot of it's intentional, actually. Um, I've noticed, especially as of late, there has been a lot of um, organizations, groups, websites that are fan fictioning history to kind of claim a part of history, um, even if there is just no evidence to stand behind it. They'll just like cherry pick something that sort of seems like evidence and they'll take it a yard wide and be like, yes, this is the new fact. And it's like, mm, not quite. So my podcast is going to be uh, just reinstating what historical things are true and what are, are not true. We're going to talk about conspiracy theories, things that were made up or altered throughout history. Um, and we're just going to get the genuine truth. Um, if you guys don't know, I do a lot of historical type content. I've done it for many years. Um, I have a lot of background in history. And um, I am always looking for more. I'm always digging deep for original sources, and I definitely am very much propaganda proof, I would like to say. So, um, th and that's simply because I look for uh, original sources. I think that is really uh, what makes um, it so easy for me to find what the truth is, is because I go down and look at old newspapers, old diary writings, old audio clips that back up something rather than an article, no matter who it's written by, .org or not, or .edu or not, I don't trust that as well as I do trusting um, actual physical evidence of the truth. So um, I am doing each episode with a lot of confidence that what I'm sharing with you guys is very factual and I have evidence that backs that up. I don't want to be uh, an add-on to the problem of us just not learning our history right. I think getting the right version of history is super important. Erasing it or doctoring it is incredibly dangerous um, in way too many ways in one. So uh, that's what the Found Records podcast is about. I found the records. <laughs> so let's go ahead and dive into our first episode here, uh, which was very popularly requested, and that was the conspiracy centered around Marilyn Monroe and correcting her legacy. Now, before we get started, I want to remind you guys that I do have a book called When Shit Hits the Fan. It's on sale right now. Um, if you like the World War II aesthetic um, or like the Fallout aesthetic, this is what my book is modeled after, but inside is actually incredibly useful information for any um, disaster, natural disaster, or war type scenario. It helps you get through anything that could happen, so it is honestly a lifesaver. Um, it's got everything you can imagine from A to Z formatted in a way that's super easy to access, so definitely consider picking it up on Amazon. Anyways, this first episode of um, The Found Records, that's so cool to say, I have my own podcast now, um, it's going to be centered around Marilyn Monroe. This was highly requested. It was more so requested because I just finished uh, writing a biopic about a year ago called Becoming Her. It's the very first biopic of Marilyn Monroe that has been rated 100% historically accurate um, by many accredited historians that have uh, centered their life around Marilyn Monroe. A lot of them, I'm talking 40 to 50 years of researching Marilyn, so to get their approval has been everything. Um, and I wrote Becoming Her with uh, the intention of uncovering the raw and honest, unbiased truth of her life, because I knew that these biopics that were coming out of her were so painfully false. Um, it's, it's borderline, no, it's not even borderline, it is defamation. Um, and I'm not a fan of the injustice that she's gone through. Um, and so I took it upon my own hands and I wrote a, a, a film series that hopefully someday will get produced so we could actually meet Marilyn Monroe for the very first time. And I say that because she is borderline unrecognizable. Her life is unrecognizable when you actually know the truth. And you know what? I think it's actually so much more interesting. I'm surprised that... Hollywood has decided to fictionalize and water her story down as if her real story is unimportant or uninteresting when it actually is 
significantly more interesting. And anyone who's read the script already, who were, you know, accredited historians have said this was so great. I couldn't put it down. Like a lot of them finished it um, within 24 hours, which is crazy because it's like 400 pages. So they were really um, enthused by it. So I'm just very glad. Um, And so I wanted to make a podcast episode centered around correcting a lot of the lies about her, like my, like my biopic someday will. Um, The reason why the biopic is not public for reading or it's not even going to be published as a book is simply because um, it is 100% historically accurate. So anyone could just take that and make their own movie. But then I would not have the control to make sure that she's fairly represented. Um, so I, it was just it would be giving power to the wrong people. I'd rather be in control of getting that made the way it needs to. So um, let's go ahead and start off with a few conspiracy theories about Marilyn Monroe um, that I think need to finally be put to rest. So conspiracy theory number one is all about who Marilyn even is. She has been painted to be this highly abused victim who was incredibly alone and helpless and and just this uh, super used person in Hollywood. And although she has had moments in which she was feeling lonely or in which she was abused, she wasn't a victim. And Marilyn and Amy Green, which was her photographer's wife, has said Marilyn Monroe is not a victim. She has always lived life on her own terms and everything that has happened to her um, in her adulthood has been on her own terms and was her own decision, which is quite beautiful because if you look at Marilyn's uh, childhood, there was a lot of things that were out of her control. She was definitely abused sexually, um, specifically around the eight-year-old mark when she went to a foster home that had a pastor. Um, He lured her into his room and did some inappropriate actions with Marilyn at a very young age. And when Marilyn came out to uh, report him to the foster mother, she was like, don't you dare talk so poorly about this great man. And that was definitely a very traumatic experience for her. Um, But if you look at like biopics like Blonde, they kind of taken the abuse that she really went through and overdid it and let it bleed into her Hollywood story when Marilyn actually didn't use her body or people didn't use her body in that way throughout her career. Um, Marilyn has had moments in which she was approached by very big, you know, executives that wanted to abuse her sexually, but she actually stood her ground. In Blonde, they made her bend over and take it, and it was absolutely disgusting and fictional. Um, it's funny because the person that they had in the, uh, movie was named Mr. Z. And I know what they're really saying Mr. Z is, is Zanuck, Mr. Zanuck. Um, Mr. Zanuck was a Hollywood executive who kind of just made all of the decisions. And, uh, he was the one for 20th Century Fox specifically. And, uh, he was definitely an abuser of many models, but he actually found Marilyn incredibly unattractive. He was the one that didn't uh, approach Marilyn sexually. He honestly thought she was ugly, and she he actually got Marilyn fired as soon as she was hired for a movie with 20th Century because he just thought, this girl is way too unphotogenic, like she's ruining all the pictures. So there was a lot of films that were never released because they were deleted. Um, they, they removed her scenes uh, under Xanax request. Uh, he just didn't find her pretty at all, which is wild to think about because she's one of the most beautiful women uh, known in film history now. Um, who actually did uh, try to uh, sexually assault her was uh, another man, uh, and he went under the name of Mr. A. Um, and he, oh, no, was it Mr. A? No, she was there to see Mr. A, but there was another man. Um, gosh, I should reference my biopic for this, but I don't have it in front of me right now. Um, but it was another executive. She was there to see Mr. A, but there was another man. Um, maybe I'll put an overlay if I remember the exact name of him. Anyways, you know, it doesn't negate the fact that, um, there was a Hollywood executive that did try to have a sexual advancement and she, she was, uh, in his office. She wasn't supposed to see him specifically. She was there to see someone else, and um, he 
started off by showing off his yacht photos and he's like, I'm going to have a yacht party. I really want you to come along in it and I want you to have some fun with me. And she was like, well, I'd love to come to the yacht party with you and your wife. She made sure to slip in your wife and he got really irritated, eventually losing his patience because he's trying to insinuate that he's interested in a sexual affair to gain the position that she wanted. Um, it was a bit of a trade-off, an indirect trade-off, and Marilyn refused, and she was like, I can't do that, sorry, and she's like, if you ever uh, invite me to something that involves your wife, I'll be there, but she ended up bailing um, from that interview, and of course, she didn't get cast for what she was auditioning for. Um, Marilyn has actually verbatim uh, stated that it was very important to her that she didn't use her body like every other Hollywood star typically did. Um, it was very common practice then for women, uh, and she was very, very, very adamant to make sure that she wasn't a part of that equation. And sh this is from her words herself in her diary that I found, um, which maybe I could put an overlay over the video here. Considering all of these circumstances, I think we can confidently say that Marilyn did not um, F her way to fame. <laughs> Um, there's actually a scene in my biopic where Marilyn is crying in her apartment. She's hungry. She hasn't eaten in God knows how long. There was a manager that she had named Johnny um, very early on, and he was a short man um, that she would make fun of at times. And uh, he was actually, unfortunately, who introduced her to uh, drugs, you know, the typical Hollywood drugs, when she was 20 years old on the dot. So she was very young. Um, his relationship with her was controversial because he was very helpful to her, but he was also the reason why she passed away eventually. Um, so there's a love-hate relationship with Johnny there that even Marilyn had herself. Um, but Johnny tried to marry her. Johnny was in love with her and she's like, I can't marry you for your money because Johnny was offering his money. He was like, I'll give you everything you want, buy you anything you need, but I want to be with you. Um, and Marilyn said, no, she's like, I can't do that. Um, so, you know, going back to when I said she was starving in her apartment, Johnny was there in her life at that point, offering to feed her, offering to buy her a car and every, anything she wanted. And she declined respectfully. And she was like, I, I'm not doing that. So she chose to starve. And there's a moment in the biopic, which is verbatim, something that she has said where she was laying in bed and she was looking up the ceiling and she just felt emaciated. She was just tired emotionally spiritually she was hungry she was thirsty she was just completely fallen apart and she felt like there was just a dark star that she was born on and this was her lowest point in her life and this was a point in her life in which she promised herself she would never go back to um we're kind of gonna segue in here to uh this idea about Norma Jean versus Marilyn Monroe, because this is something I definitely don't want to forget to mention. So Marilyn Monroe's identity has a lot of conspiracy theory itself, and her name as well. A lot of people assume that Marilyn Monroe hated Marilyn Monroe, and that was also shown in the blonde biopic as well. Another painful inaccuracy. I actually got the privilege to look at Marilyn Monroe's therapy sessions, um, you know, the, the, the transcripts of that, and that's where I learned that Marilyn actually did not, did not hate Marilyn Monroe. She hated Norma Jean. Um, and we see this in her diary as well. Um, Norma Jean to her, which is her birth name, was an ugly, poor child who was insecure and depressed and hurt and weak. That's how Marilyn saw her younger self. And... She wanted to run away from her younger self more than anything, and she did. Um, she chose her name. Obviously, uh, an executive helped her, but she decided to change her name willingly. And uh, the, the name change originally was for Hollywood purposes because her name at the time when she was married to James was Norma Jean Doherty. And they, you know, he was like, you know, that's not a star's name. We need a star's name. So they went through a book of names and they decided on Marilyn Monroe and Marilyn loved it. Um, Marilyn over the years, as she got older, um, wanted so desperately to become this beloved, beautiful, talented woman in which she ended up becoming. 
Um, and even though at times she would reference herself in third person, like Marilyn Monroe, the caricature, um, she still preferred the identity of Marilyn Monroe. It was, in fact, very triggering if you called her Norma Jean. It made her feel very funny and start remembering all of the trauma from her life. So she was not a fan of being called that unless you were maybe her foster parents, she would allow it. But she really did prefer Marilyn Monroe. And we see that in her diary where she states that. Uh, well, you know, let me not get ahead of myself. Let me go back to uh, when she started becoming incredibly famous. And that was when she did uh, a photo that ended up on the very first Playboy magazine in history. So this was the first issue and Marilyn Monroe was on that cover. Unfortunately, a lot of people uh, misunderstand that cover and assume that she, you know, uh, used her body to get famous. It actually, it was a contrary. That photo was released against her consent, completely unknowing. By the time that, that photo was released, she was um, doing a lot of modeling. She did a few movies. A lot of movies she was cut out from, unfortunately, but she was starting to get a little known. Um, and what really threw her into stardom was the um, Kelly photos where she has the red background and she is completely in the nude. She took those photos um, years prior before even really getting into the industry. She wasn't in the industry quite yet. She was more so doing very loose modeling at that time. And she did it because she had her car repoed. So, you know, in, in pursuit of getting $60 so she can get her car back, um, she agreed to do these red velvet photos that the photographer promised and swore that he would uh, paint her to look a little bit different so she was unrecognizable and that it would only be a local release for a calendar. So she was like a little hesitant and she made sure that it was very clear between her and the photographer that it would only be a local release and that she would be the old school photoshopped, which is just painted over to look like a different person. And he, of course, lied. <laughs> I mean, it was a half truth. Um, and of course, when Hugh Hefner was in pursuit of uh, nude models and nude photos for his uh, Playboy idea, there came the offer of Marilyn Monroe's nude photos that were then exchanged and became the first issue of Playboy with her name in big letters, Marilyn Monroe in the nude. Um, and this was completely against her consent. When she found it, she was mortified, but she quickly came to terms with it um, because a lot of girls at this time were kind of doing the same thing. So it wasn't that she was the first one. It's just that she was the most famous one. Um, and she wasn't even that famous yet. Actually, this photo is what made her truly famous because the studios at the time were asking her if she could deny that, that, that those photos were her. And she was like, well, I'm not going to do that. It's very obviously me. Like, look at it. It's me. Like, I'm not going to go and lie to everybody. So when she was interviewed and asked about the photos, she said, yep, those are me. And that's what basically um, made her super famous. I mean, at least amongst the men. And uh, then she was asked shortly after to sing to the American troops, which is a very popular moment in history where she wears this very, very dark dress with a lot of sequins. And she's performing in front of uh, so, so many American troops um, in Korea. So after that, she was just everywhere. Everyone wanted to hire her as, you know, the sexy kitten in, in every movie that they had uh, lined up and she took a lot of jobs from a lot of other uh, well-respected and loved uh, femme fatales of her time. And she became uh, the most sought after actress because of those photos. So um, it's one of those bittersweet things where she didn't ask for it, but she got what she wanted and that was to be famous. Marilyn said that she wanted more than anything to be famous. She wanted to be loved and owned by someone. And if that meant the world, then she would be happy. And so she got what she wanted. Now let's go and debunk another conspiracy theory. This one's a little bit more modern of a conspiracy theory, but that is that Marilyn Monroe is Mexican. <laughs> um, as a Latina myself, that would be really cool, but I'm going to tell you that Marilyn is not, in fact, Mexican. Where this conspiracy theory came from and started going like all over the internet to the point where like if you Google it, it's the first search. Like it's actually very dangerous how uh, much information is false on Google nowadays. Um, 
the the conspiracy theory stemmed from uh, people finding out that Marilyn's mother was born in Mexico. But let me stop you there before you get too excited. Marilyn, Marilyn's mother was born in Mexico, yes, but under a technicality because Marilyn's uh, grandmother had given birth to Gladys, which is Marilyn's mother, in Mexico because she was there for work. So her grandparents, Marilyn's grandparents, were artists, and they had a job to do in Mexico. It just so happened that um, Marilyn's grandmother was pregnant, gave birth in Mexico, and then shortly after, she actually left Mexico after the work was done and raised Marilyn's mother in California. So Marilyn's mother is Mexican by a technicality. This doesn't make Marilyn Mexican because Marilyn never applied for Mexican citizenship. So because Marilyn was born in California, um, she would have had to apply for the Me Mexican citizenship, which she would have been eligible for. Um, but because she never did, this would mean that she is not even on a technicality Mexican. This would be, imagine it as the equivalence of me having a child on a Jamaican cruise ship vacation. I had the child in Jamaica. My child would be Jamaican in terms of like the paperwork, but it doesn't mean that my child is Jamaican just like descent wise. So the same applies to Marilyn's mother. And being that Marilyn never got the technical citizenship that she would need to be technically classified as Mexican, she's just so far, far removed from the concept of being one. Um, she was a, an American who has Irish and um, Dutch ancestry, so very much white. <laughs> the next conspiracy theory is another modern one, and that is that Marilyn was gay. So we have another community trying to claim Marilyn as well. Um, Marilyn Monroe was definitely not gay, and this is verbatim her words here in her private diary. There's no reason for her to lie in her own diary, you know? Um, but the conspiracy theory comes from her diary, actually. They just omitted the second half of the paragraph. So in the first half, Marilyn talks about being sexually confused because early on in her, um, upbringing, especially when she became of age, you know, 18, 19, 20, she was just very confused as to why she couldn't feel sexual attraction for the men that she knew. And uh, she just felt nothing. And she's like, well, I find women beautiful. So am I a lesbian? You know, when, especially at a time where um, sexuality wasn't discussed, you, you do have these questions. Um, you do wonder these things because we don't have anyone wiser to help us through these thoughts. Um, and so Marilyn was just also just trying to understand herself at this age, but it wasn't until she fell in love with uh, this man who was a singer. She didn't want to disclaim who he was, so we don't know who he was, but we do know he was a popular singer, and she met him um, during an audition that she felt like she bombed, and uh, they fell for each other. Uh, he would sing to her all the time, and play the piano for her. And he was so romantic. He was good looking, according to Marilyn. And when she had her first sexual experience with him, she was like, oh, I understand sex now. I get it. This is amazing. Um, so what it really took was just Marilyn falling in love. And so maybe perhaps I would then classify Marilyn as more demisexual, maybe, um, because Marilyn didn't really have casual encounters or an appetite for sex like a lot of people might have um but when it when love was involved when she could romanticize a person she very much enjoyed sex with them so um this is all Marilyn's words by the way not mine and um but but we don't want to label Marilyn either if she's not here to label herself so um that's why I I would say that if I were to put a name on it, I would say maybe demisexual. But again, she's not here to confirm that. So as of now, she's just straight. Um, a lot of people also have uh, made some conspiracy theories about her and Natasha Lightest, which was her acting coach. Um, Natasha was significantly older than Marilyn. Um, she was in her 40s when she was schooling Marilyn and Marilyn in her, in her writings and her notes 
has expressed the discomfort that Natasha brought her. There's a conspiracy theory that that they had an affair together, that they loved each other, they lived like husband and wife, and people completely misunderstood and taken Marilyn out of context for the sake of making it seem like Marilyn was in love with this woman. But um, there has been findings that I've found that in her diary, she, she expresses Nat- Natasha made her uncomfortable. Natasha was definitely interested in her on a sexual level, um, if not romantically as well. And Marilyn had a conversation with Natasha at some point where she's just like, could we just please act? Could we just work? Please? Like, I, I, why does it have to get weird? So um, obviously that's not verb- verbatim. She said it in the words that she chose, but um, that was what the point she was trying to get across at the time. And so uh, Natasha, uh, she would have loved if Marilyn loved her back, but Marilyn absolutely did not look at her that way. And that is confirmed in her diary as well. And is also featured in my biopic, Becoming Her, where it is um, performed. Most of my biopic actually is performed um, word for word of what Marilyn said. Mo- like n- I would say like 90% of my biopic Becoming Her is Marilyn Monroe's w- words exactly to the T, like with even with the, with the stutters involved as well. So it was very important to me. Um, so yeah, that's another conspiracy theory that we can't uh, keep continuing. Now, the next conspiracy theory is centered around Marilyn's love life. A lot of people assume that she was just, you know, going around town with every boy and ruining marriages. And that's farthest from the truth. Marilyn has only been with James Doherty, which was her first husband. And she divorced him because um, she wanted to pursue her career in acting and he didn't support that. Um, Plus, they were only married because she needed to get out of the foster system. He was an adult and she was 16. So that needed to end. Um, then it was, uh, Joe DiMaggio, which was a baseball star that ended due to a couple instances of abuse, uh, that she was not going to tolerate. It was only twice and that was enough for her. So she divorced him. Then it was Arthur Miller. Well, actually between James Doherty and, uh, Joe DiMaggio, that was a secret lover, (laughs) the, the singer that we don't know who, who it is. Okay. And then it was, uh, Arthur Miller, um, now that, that one, you know, he, Arthur Miller was in the middle of a divorce, but he was still technically married. So yeah, that one's a little iffy. Um, they divorced because Arthur's just, it was just not compatible with Marilyn, to be honest with you. Arthur is a little bit too cold, too logical. Marilyn needed someone emotionally intelligent and Arthur was not that. Um, she had an affair with, uh, Yves Montand, which is an Italian French singer. He was married, that was a little messy, um, and Yves was very sweet and and suave, and she bought into it and thought, "Oh, this is the guy who's going to run away with me." It was it was a mess, um, but they never were together. In fact, Yves then later, when the rumors got out, uh, shitted on Marilyn. <laughs> it was she was very disappointed in that because um, he didn't take any accountability in the fact that he cheated on his wife as much as she cheated on Arthur. Anyways. So those were the those are the sticky situations. Um, but then after all of that, she then uh, started j- dating Joe DiMaggio again, um, shortly after being bailed from the mental institute that she was put in against her consent. And um, uh, Joe at the time, Joe at the time, he definitely went to therapy and he wanted her back and he worked for it. And Marilyn felt that they were more compatible the second time around because he got therapy. Therefore, they were together um, and they were planning to get married before she passed away. So those were all of the um, actual like situationships and relationships she was a part of, which is not many. I mean, if you want to compare it to the average body count of women nowadays, (laughs) I would have to say she's a saint. (laughs) Um, Not that there's anything even wrong with either or lifestyle. I think it's no place for anyone to judge, but we do need to paint Marilyn fairly in the, in the light that she wasn't, um, you know, hypersexual whatsoever, or wasn't with all too many partners. She can count all of them on two hands. So a lot, where that comes from is just the misunderstanding of her movie characters that she played, which were more promiscuous, sexual, um, man eaters, um, 
which were not a direct reflection of who she was at all. So it's important to separate the art from the artist in this case scenario. Now, the next conspiracy theory has to do with Marilyn Monroe and abortions. This is something that has always been a conspiracy theory, but it, w- it went full force when the movie Blonde came out. And now everyone believes that Marilyn had abortions, which is heartbreaking if you know Marilyn, because Marilyn wanted children more than anything at any time, at any time. The times that she got pregnant, she wasn't even ready for. It was only twice that she got pregnant. The first time she wasn't ready for it. The second time she was, it was on purpose. Um, But both times she wanted to see them through and she did. Unfortunately, what Marilyn had was something called endometriosis, which makes women infertile. Um, And so her babies were miscarriages, not abortions. And it's really horrifying that blonde put this idea in their heads Um, I don't know for what, maybe a pro-abortion propaganda or something, but, you know, considering Marilyn's personal personal beliefs in that, um, it's just very unfair to force her into this pro-abortion light when she would have never, ever decided on one because more than anything, she wanted the love of a child. Um, Family was incredibly important to her. Having a husband and a child was her end goal. Um, aside from being considered the best actress, which was also another personal end goal for her. And so um, I just wanted to make sure that I highlight that in this podcast, that Marilyn had uh, endometriosis and she had miscarriages and only two of them. Um, They were not abortions. The next conspiracy theory is centered around Marilyn Monroe and JFK. Uh, That one comes from just the fact that um, it makes a good story. Marilyn and the president sounds cool. You know, imagine that. It's a, it's a fan fiction work that has existed even while she was alive and especially after she passed. And that idea comes from the fact that she performed Happy Birthday, Mr. President in a very seductive manner in a new dress. And they assumed that she was trying to seduce the president um, by surprise. Uh, that performance was incredibly planned. It wasn't even planned by her. It was planned by her team. The outfit was pre-approved by the administration, and Jackie Kennedy was very well aware of how that performance was going to go because Marilyn rehearsed it, The I think it was the night before. Um, she re- rehearsed it on stage at Madison Square Garden, um, exactly how she planned it. She got the okay, and then she went and performed it for the birthday. So it was not a surprise to literally anyone but the president. Um, Even Jackie Kennedy knew about it. Um, And I think actually the president knew about it, but I don't want to speak on that because I I don't remember um, in this moment in time. But I do know that it was completely pre-planned and calculated. And it was more so to continue uh, Marilyn's fame. It was a fame um, move, you know, just to, you know, keep her name going, keep her trending. Now, Marilyn only met the president a couple of times, and both of them were in complete public. The first time was at a party, which she barely spoke to him, and she wrote this in her diary that it was just the most brief, like, nothing ever. And the second time was uh, the Happy Birthday, Mr. President event. They had an after party, and she actually took Arthur Miller's father to that party, Um, and it was because Arthur Miller's father was a huge fan huge fan of um, the president. So even though Marilyn and Arthur were divorced at the time, she considered Arthur's father and his love for the president and took him to this event. So she was with him the whole night. Um, And she spoke to the president very briefly um, with Bobby Kennedy. And and that was that. That was that. It was like a short little meet and greet. And that was that. Um, Now, Marilyn was friends with uh, a lady named Pat who was Uh, part of the Kennedys, but um, there is no evidence to back up that Marilyn ever hung out with um, JFK or uh, his brother in private. Um, So because of the lack of evidence, it's just unfair to assume that Marilyn had some sort of affair in any way, shape, or form with either of them. Next conspiracy theory is centered around Marilyn Monroe and her sense of religion. A lot of people have her religion all sorts of confused um, in many ways than one. 
Um, a lot of people assume Marilyn Monroe was this like God hating atheist. And a lot of people also assume that Marilyn was this hyper religious person. There's actually, it's kind of interesting how there's two conspiracy theories on the complete opposite sides of the spectrum based off of some cherry picking that has been done. And, um, so Marilyn Monroe's religion is pretty interesting because it fluctuated and changed a lot through her entire life. And she has gone through a lot of different religions. Actually, a lot of people don't know that. Marilyn's religion fluctuated based on her environment, to be honest with you. She grew up uh, with the Christian faith, and she had illustrations of her drawing God and um, that she would hold very dear. And it wasn't until she was sexually assaulted by the pastor that she decided uh, that God isn't real. Because why would a pastor do that to her? So that's where uh, that notion comes from. So she went through her adulthood up until even filming Gentlemen Prefer Blondes, not believing in God. But throughout that time and throughout her beginnings, she definitely called out to God many times. Um, I felt like she, her and her relationship with God fluctuated. Um, like she wanted to believe in him and then she didn't want to believe in him when he didn't answer her. Um, I feel like that was really the dynamic that I, that I've observed in her diary. Um, she wanted to believe in him, but she wasn't given enough to believe in him. And um, then when she married Arthur Miller, she converted to Judaism and she took it very seriously. She wanted to feel included in his family. Arthur wasn't very pleased by her conversion. Um, and it was an interesting dynamic there. Um, then they divorced and Marilyn's practice kind of uh, dwindled away a little bit, and then by the end of her life, she went back to atheism with Christian practices in the sense of, like, she celebrated Christmas as the last thing um, with Joe DiMaggio before her passing. So she was kind of all over the place uh, when it comes to religion and when it comes to her belief in a god or not. Um, but she was never, she's never said anything that was anti-God in public, which people keep repeating that she did. Um, nor was she super, super religious either. Um, she was kind of just a bit, a little bit of everywhere. And lastly, we want to talk about Marilyn Monroe's death. This is the biggest conspiracy of all time, and that is that Marilyn Monroe was murdered. Oh my gosh. Um, this conspiracy theory goes way back. It goes right back directly to the time of her death, when this crazy conspiracy nut came out with an article talking about her being murdered. Um, if you know Marilyn Monroe's drug history, it started off when she was 20 years old, introduced by her agent Johnny. Um, and this drug use was something that she struggled with throughout her whole life. It's the reason why she deteriorated as a person. Um, she just got less and less together because of these drugs. Um, she would take it for insomnia. She would take it for anxiety, especially anxiety. She was a very anxious person, especially um, on set. And she would take it for um, just to hype her up. So she had a concoction in her bag at all times. And uh, her body became immune to these drugs throughout the decade-long abuse, um, over a decade-long abuse. And uh, throughout the years, she would scale up and scale up, especially on a drug specifically called Nembutol. Um, and she had three, uh, uh, towards the time of her death, she had 300 milligrams of Nembutol, uh, prescribed to her. And that was only one little part of the concoction, which she would call a vitamin cocktail. <laughs> um, she definitely had a horrible relationship with drugs that her peers have desperately tried to get her help uh, for. It's the reason why she was thrown in a mental institute because she, after Clark Gable's death, um, made some very strange remarks about not wanting to continue life, though she was just expressing it. She didn't actually mean it. And in her diary, she says, I would never kill myself. So she says that, you know, in her words, I would never do that. Um, but, you know, it's kind of one of those moments where uh, people in her life took that very literally and when they called her back and she wasn't answering, they freaked out. This was specifically her screenwriter that went and requested that her doctor checked on her. And they found her in her bed, um, just drugged out a little bit. And 
they were like, okay, Marilyn's fine. She was just taking her drugs and sleeping, sleeping it off. Then uh, shortly after that, she had an accidental overdose. This was a pretty serious one um, where she just mismeasured. And it wasn't the first time she mismeasured, but it was the biggest time she mismeasured to the point where uh, the, the doctor had to um, help her vomit it all out. And uh, they had to put her uh, with the with the nurse, essentially, to live with her, to keep an eye on her so it doesn't happen again. So the nurse could help uh, with her prescriptions and make sure that she doesn't mismeasure again. When you're very, very used to these drugs, you uh, tend to go more and go further with them and take more. And there's proof of this in her medical rece receipts that I found personally towards just, I think it was, uh, I would say maybe 12 or 13 days before her passing in which she went to two different doctors and searched for an inhuman amount of uh, prescriptions. She said that they weren't working anymore. This was when she was already taking 300 milligrams of Nembutal, which was enough for a grown man. She wanted more. She wanted as much for a horse. <laughs> and she was like, I can't feel them anymore. I, I need them stronger. I need to sleep. I have a, a movie that's very important. We need to get it done. I keep showing up late because I'm not getting enough sleep and my hours are all messed up. I need you to prescribe me more. And the doctor was like, I'm not doing that. Are you? No, no, I'm not doing that. So she went to a different doctor. That doctor prescribed her the crazy amount of it. Um, and then, uh, you know, mixed with the cocktail of other things that she had, when she took them, that is when she passed away and had an accidental overdose. And um, again, it, it does come from the fact of drug abuse. And a lot of people uh, definitely have written conspiracy theories like, oh, there was no drugs found in her stomach. Her body was uh, tempered with. She was laying face down. She, her door was locked. All these like points being made. But let me go down that list. Her door was locked because she slept naked, like, like ritually naked. And she had a nurse in the house at the time. So she locked her door when she went to bed. Of course, it was locked from the inside. Yes, because everyone locks their door from the inside, <laughs> especially if you're sleeping butt naked and you have someone in the house. Um, so they had to break her window to get into her room. She was face down um, because she was a stomach sleeper, um, I, as am I. So <laughs> that's pretty normal. The bruising that you see in her photos is not that she was beaten or anything like that. That That's called um, pooling. So basically during like the rigor mortis stage where, where like the body starts stiffening, the body starts, um, all the blood starts going to one side of it. Um, it'll look like bruising, but that's just the blood pooling down into the face. It's a process of, of, of death and it's a very ugly one. So her face laying face down, the blood was pooling to the surface of her face and it looked like bruises. Um, if you look at literally any dead body photos, which I'm sure you can access on the internet, you'll find them and you'll see that's a very common effect that happens after some time. And that specific process, if you want to look it up, is specifically called liver mortis, um, if you want to look further into that, um, as well as uh, the drugs not being found in her stomach. Um, so stomach acids uh, can dissolve very quickly. She definitely had that on an empty stomach, considering that she had an addiction um, people who are addicted to prescriptions for such a long time can dissolve them abnormally fast, at more than the average person can. Um, as you can see, 300 milligrams of Nembutal went right through her system. So that's how fast that these drugs are dissolving in her system. So, of course, after hours of, of the drug sitting in her stomach acid, even after death, um, yeah, it's no surprise that it dissolved in the stomach of an addict. Um, and so, you know, it, you know, there's also the conspiracy theories of, oh, Marilyn's body was tampered with, or it was missing for six hours. I actually found all of the, uh, timestamps of her body. Uh, Joe DiMaggio was actually there for the majority of the process up into the, fu up until the funeral. So he was looking out for her best interests. I mean, he was who Marilyn was going to remarry again, so it was very important that she was taken care of. Um, there's no evidence showing any form of 
sexual abuse after death. That's such a disgusting conspiracy theory. And that where that comes from is really, again, painting Marilyn in this victim mentality um, because it makes her story seem a lot more sad than it actually is. People love to overplay her as this like uh, as this victim, as this wounded lamb. But she really, truly was not. There were moments of weakness in her life as anyone else. But she was a very resilient, strong person who was very much in control of herself. Um, sometimes for the best and sometimes for the worst. Um, there were many moments where she had the opportunity to get off of these drugs. Um, and unfortunately, uh, as you can see, she chose not to. And this is what happened because of that. Um, but at the end of the day, everything that happened to Marilyn in her adulthood was, for the most part, entirely up to her, and she was very proud of that, um, and it was, it was a personality trait you could not shake her from. What Marilyn says goes. So those are the, so those are the conspiracy theories. I've done um, a few more in-depth with evidence TikToks, if you want to check them out on my TikTok page, uh, specifically about Marilyn's death as well. Um, if you want like more details on it, but, uh, yeah, so those are the most common things of Marilyn and I hope that you guys learned something in this podcast episode and in the next episode, um, I don't know exactly which one I'm going to do next, but I do know that I will be covering further topics of misunderstandings. Like I'd really love to talk about Betty Boop and the misunderstanding of her history. A lot of people nowadays are actually getting her history wrong, um, after believing it's been corrected, it actually has been corrected incorrectly. And, um, I will get into that in a, in a future episode, but if you have any suggestions of what you'd like to see, uh, talked about in a future episode, drop them down below and let me know and make sure you check out the somber hour over on somber studios, which is my second podcast. It's all horror related. Um, it hasn't come out yet. If you're seeing this first episode, I'm sure, but um, it will be coming out incredibly soon, and we're going to be talking all things horror movies, lore, and scary stories. So it's over on Somber Studios, a YouTube channel, and the podcast name is The Somber Hour. So thank you guys so much for watching and listening, and I'll see you guys in episode two.